You're listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. This episode was made possible in part by the Emissary Author Workshops and our title of the week, The Hope of War, from Emissary Author Larry Cripps. Go to publishwithemissary.com forward slash workshops and thehopeofwar.com for more details. Well, it is another exciting episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. Paul Edwards, along with my partner in crime, my friend, my colleague, Jason Todd, the one and only. And uh, we have <clears throat> a, a, an episode for you today that I think is going to challenge you a little bit uh, because we're going to talk about some of the key ingredients that you really need um, to find you know, to find success and momentum as a published author. Uh, but we're bringing it. We're bringing it from a uh, perhaps a, a, a slightly different angle. Uh, our guest today is David Osk, who's a friend of mine, uh, a colleague and associate through the Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind. Uh, he owns a business. He's based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and he is working on his second book, <clears throat> um, which is. Oh shoot! I'm I'm drawing a blank on the title now. The Guardians uh, of Grit. Guardians of Grit. And uh, his, David maintains that there's a difference between resilience and grit. So let's find out what that is. Let's bring him on. David Osk, welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast, my friend. How are you? Gentlemen, I'm glad to be here. I'm doing well today. Thanks for having me on. Happy to have you. Now, you are unique uh, in that your first book was written for children. Yeah. An illustrated children's book. And then your second book is written for fathers. And... Uh, some people take the kids book path, some people take the adult path, but few people bridge the two. Man, I tell you what, you know, what was interesting is, is really for most of my life, I had thought about, you know, being an author someday, right? You know, it wasn't necessarily sure what I would even write about. And my, my friend, Paul DeBrito, um, had a, a business book published with Taylor and Seal Publishing, um, probably a few years before, you know, I did. And he asked me, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what I would write about. And he challenged me in that moment. He goes, he said, David, you need to write. He said, I want to, I want to challenge you. And when you, when you have a book that's, uh, you think might be, you know, worth writing or an idea, you know, let's, you know, I'll introduce you to, you know, Dr. Custerary and so on. Well, what was interesting is, is a few days later, I'm, you know, laying in bed. This is when my kids were were younger. We did every night, and I would tell them a little story about two little British mice named Fire and Ice, and I'd make up a story on the fly. And it always started out with, you know, uh, Fire and Ice are two mice who are very nice. They always look for spice, and they never think twice, and they love to roll the dice. And I, you know, so I've got two little rascals who are sitting in the bed with me, and my wife walked by one day and she goes, you might want to start writing those down. They're getting kind of good. Well, I didn't tell her about my conversation with Paul. So the next morning got up and I wrote down one of my stories. It was the one I, of course, kind of told the night before really on the fly. And I recorded it into, you know, my phone and I, you know, made a PDF and I sent it to Paul. He sent it to, you know, the publisher and like two days later, I got a phone call and they just said, we really like this, you know, can, you know, would you want to have a conversation? And we were kind of off to the races there. So it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a curveball, really, you know, at the time I hadn't, hadn't thought about it. That was um, five or six years ago. And then um, this, this past year, I've been really feeling, you know, a, a real sense of mission uh, to men, mainly to fathers. And, you know, I'm, I don't want to get too, I don't know, into the weeds here, but um, we all know what happens, you know, when men don't lead, right? Um, on, on a, on a ma macro and a micro level, everything rises and falls on leadership. In fact, I would argue that it, and this is by no means disrespecting women, I think they're better people than we are. But when men fail to lead, everybody loses. When yep. men when men lead well, everybody wins. And you will you would never hear a child or or, or a wife say ever 
boy, I wish my husband didn't lead so well. Yeah. And, and in fact, it's just the opposite, right? You know, the, 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 the sigh, right? The sigh in a, in a, in a woman's voice or a child even, you know, they might not even have the courage to vocalize it, but they would long, you know, for their dad to step up and to love and lead with courage and nobility and lead with with clarity and a strategy. So um, not to get too long-winded here, but over the last couple of years, I've been working with um, Dr. Andy Garrett uh, around, you know, what he calls the true north blueprint. And it really helps people just build self-awareness. What is it that lights you up? What is it that makes you tick? And to build a framework, you know, around that, your uniqueness, right? We all have a fingerprint and a retina scan, if you will, and a soul print that is really, really different. And, and when men remove that big question mark, right? When they, when, when they build that sense of clarity, when they walk into the room and they've predetermined, they've labeled who they are and who they're not and the impact that they want to have, the things that they're going to say yes to and no to, the things that light them up. I like to say, by the way, the things that give your goosebumps goosebumps, right? Hmm. What, are you, what are you willing to suffer for, right? That word passion. It's amazing what starts to shift in a man's life. But then, you know, what if, and we all do, what if your kids are struggling? And I don't care if they're eight years old or they're 18, right? Avoidance, apathy, anger, um, you know, depression, anxiety. They, they, you know, they're just that sin of comparison everywhere they go. And of course, they need to look to their parents. That's what their parents are there for is to raise, not just provide for, but raise. I'm talking raise young people. Mm. But guess what? Most men... They don't. They not only don't have a clue how to do that. They have no even reason why they even woke up in the morning. Mm. I mean, and, and I know that sounds kind of bleak, but I think the proof is in the pudding. If you look around, we're we're falling apart at the seams, right? Men want to be girls. Girls want to be men, and now we've got teenagers wanting to be animals, literally. So I I, I don't I know that sounds rather dramatic and all this stuff, right? I don't care. Yeah. I'm on a mission. To, to, to paint a noble good paradigm for fathers to institute and implement immediately into their own lives and that of their children. People like us do things like this. When yeah. you've predetermined, right? Not just some stupid credo on the wall, but when you've predetermined those things that are valuable, noble, and precious, and good, and you start pouring that kind of stuff into your family, you know, get ready for things to get really good. Yeah. Well, before we before we delve deeper into this, I think, important topic that you're talking about, I want to highlight for our listeners and viewers the two directions that you have <laughs> brought up in, 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 in book writing. Yeah. Number, the first one is something I just think about as pull through. You, you're doing something and people ask you for more of it. And it wasn't something that you thought, you know, I got to get this message out there. You're just doing it in, in the normal course of business. And like in your case, hey, I'm just I am just talking to my kids and somebody else says, hey, you know what? Have you ever thought about? Right. And and <laughs> at, that I talk about pull through. You don't have to you don't have to cast it out there uh, and, and pressure people to take your message. They're asking for it anyway. Yeah, that's the first thing. And then the second thing I'm thinking about in in regard to this message to men is a message that you must share and yeah, you are absolutely. going to talk about it in some way, yeah. whether they like it or not. Those I think are two inter two very distinct paths. What is it? What has it been like for you as you're approaching the second book versus the first book? Well, of course the first book was just whimsical and fun, right? It was, it was almost more of a dare. And I, and at the same time, I, you know, to have that moment with my, kids and our neighbor's kids and my nephews and, you know, the, the, the nine people that bought the book, you know, it was, <laughs> it was really fun. And I, you know, th but, you know, right now though, like, you know, this is, this is missional to me. I'm not writing a book because I want people to call me an author. I don't care about that. I'm writing a book because there's a message that is just near and dear to my heart. And I want dads, you know, to, um, by the way, my, my favorite favorite quote as of late is uh, by Benjamin Disraeli. He's a former PM of England back in the 1800s. And he said, the greatest good you can do for another is not to share with him your riches, but to reveal to him his own. 
Yeah. And I think that is one of the greatest ways through the paradigm of grit and resilience to look at your kids and say, let me introduce you to yourself so that you in and of yourself can become gritty and resilient. And, and um, so I, I think that for me, you know, where, where the first book was just fun, right? This is way more, I'm looking to the future and I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm yeah, well more on a mission than I am just trying to, you know, write something about myself, which is fine too, if I had more of an interesting life, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear it um, distinctly and I, and just having some familiarity um, with uh, Dr. Andy Garrett and the, the background work that, uh, that went into what he's brought forth and the close <clears throat> relationship the two of you formed uh, working on that. Uh, gives me uh, insight, not visible or audible on this podcast, obviously, but insight mm -hmm. into the direction you're taking people when they interact with that. Yeah. And it's a very, very good one. It's one that says, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, much like we often tell authors, uh, if you want to write a book because you think that uh, you're going to make a bunch of money, yeah. Uh, or if that's your primary motivation, you're in for a disappointing experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, we quite honestly don't want to be blamed for that. So we're going to pass on publishing you with our, with yeah. our label, right? Um, it's not to say that we uh, are, are willy-nilly about um, the whole concept of recouping the cost of your investment. That's a that's very sound business principle. But at the same time, if you are... Um, <clears throat> If you're pinning your hopes on that, you're in big doo doo. Yeah, yeah. And, and Paul, I hope I answered your question there. Is that was you know with regard? Yeah, I hope I answered your question. If you want to follow up on that too, I'm happy to to dive a bit deeper there too. So, which question did I ask? Well, I'm sorry, Jason. Not <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, you had asked, you know, this uh, kind of this this idea of you know pull through. I think you 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 said. And um, I just want to make sure that I understood that correctly as well. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. No. So, so when you're <clears throat> so thinking about that, Dave, what what would you say? Like you're you're talking now to, you know, uh, somebody who has potential to read your book, and you're describing, you're, you're trying to get across the, you know, one of the things you mentioned that we're going to talk about is that there's a difference between resilience and grit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I was going with my commentary. There is, you know, in a, in a very similar format, we tell authors um, it's resilience and grit on your part as the author, even way more than us as the publisher mm, Yeah, that is going to propel that book, not, we don't, we're not trying to do the whole bestseller thing here. We're trying to get it into the hands of the right of the people who need to know it. And whether that's 500 people or, or 500 million people is irrelevant. Hmm. So, so I'll, how about this? I, I, so inside of this, you know, the paradigm of being an author, right? Well, let, let me paint a bit of a picture with and how grit and resilience can play in here. So say you have a continuum of, you know, zero to a negative 10 and then zero to a positive 10, right? Mm -hmm. I almost feel like the, you know, this and it's been this experience for me is the you know the the negative side if if you will is writing the book and and why because it's hard yeah. right every single day uh, you know i sit down to write and i'm like was that any good was that just a bunch of nonsense you know you've you've got imposter syndrome you've got you know just that that head game and of course on a very basic level right hey this is something else i'm throwing into my world that is quote unquote work. If you mm -hmm. want to write a book, you can't just willy nilly your way into it. It's, it's, you got to have a disciplined time that you're going to sit down and write. So I actually got a, a, a coach. I've got a, a book uh, accountability partner. So we have to log our time every single day, seven days a week. And um, so there's that side, of, you know, so with regards to resiliency, there is, it's, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're getting knocked down. So resiliency mm -hmm. is what it's, it's getting knocked down. It's getting punched in the face or whatever, right? And springing back to where you were. And, and of course, that word kind of implies getting up more quickly. If I'm a resilient person, 
right? I can get knocked down, if you will, and get get up quicker. So there's less downtime. Mm -hmm. And and of course the you know the ROI there, right? Very uh, literally financially and otherwise is realized. The, the the longer you stay down, and I mean you're it's it kind of compounds. Mm -hmm. So then when I think about grit though, I'm thinking, okay, that zero to a positive 10, you know, we, it's a, my, my buddy Glenn made the comment the other day, grit is for under your feet. It's like, you've got traction, but mm -hmm. it's, it's this idea of I'm moving to that positive side and I'm willing to push through hard things, right? Get out there and talk about it and sell it and, and, and do those things because what I believe on the other side is, is worth fighting for. Yeah. And, and here's, what's fascinating though, is if you, if you, jump inside of, of each of those, those paradigms. What is it? Like, what's the genesis of it? I mean, truth of the matter, you can have extrinsic genesis, if you will, or, or motivations, right? I, I mean, I might want to be famous. I might right. want to make a lot of money. I want, I might want this external, you know, applause or stimulus. And even on the resilient side, right? I might want to just get up quicker so I don't look like an idiot or look like a loser. But here's what I think is really fascinating when, when you, when you understand, um, all right, I'm going to get kind of deep here for a second. So authenticity, where do we get that word? Author comes from the word author. I didn't make me right. I didn't choose my eye color. I didn't choose my taste buds. I didn't choose my personality. I chose nothing. Hmm. And those of us who have children know they come out of the gate, very hardwired me and my siblings we're incredibly different. Parker and Kate are really different. And when they're young, they're not thinking about being authentic, right? They're doing their deal. They're not, yeah. they're not conscious observers of themselves. They're just, Hey, don't touch that. Or, you know, I'm going to go write a song and I'm going to go play with guns and I'm going to go, you know, they're just doing their deal. So here's, what's fascinating though, is when you understand that I need to start identifying who I am, that's identity. You've identified authorship, no pun intended here. You know, it's, it's, so you, so in, in general, you start identifying what is it that gives my goosebumps goosebumps? What is it that makes me mad that I'm willing to fight for? What, you know, what am I passionate about? What am I, what are my strengths? What are my convictions, my values, the virtues I want to impart? What is that David Osk shaped dent in the universe? You can shift from an extrinsic motivation mm -hmm. to an intrinsic motivation where you've got kind of clean fuel and the, and the fuel is this when you step out in your own authenticity and identity right and you act in, in accordance with what you have defined as you it feels good it feels authentic it feels genuine so that word authentic authenticity right starts with author authenticity but it gives you a sense of authority in your life yeah. as opposed to that big stinking question mark that you have inside of your heart and head, you know, when you're, you don't quite know when you've got imposter syndrome and you walk into a room and you're just kind of scared and you're comparing yourself to everybody, you're driving to some, you know, big function or whatever it is. And you're second guessing yourself and all that kind of thing. What happens is, is when you, when you've predetermined, right, here's who I am, here's who I'm not. People like me do things like this. You get to those places and you're on mission, right? You're looking for the loneliest person in the room. You're looking for, you know, just to make a friend as opposed to, will somebody please come over here and tell me that I'm great and start asking me questions because I'm so scared. I started implementing these things with my kids when they were young. And I'm talking, you know, five years old when Parker went to, you know, Bright Horizons preschool down here and he didn't want to, you know, first four or five days, he's crying when we left and, you know, kind of normal. Right. But I flipped the switch in that kid one day and I looked at him and I said, Parker, this is not about you, son. You're on mission here. There's lonely kids here. I want you to go find the loneliest person in the room and make a friend, ask him questions. Mm. It changed everything. Got him, you know, building authenticity and identity is not staring at our own belly buttons, right? It's, it's unto and into purpose. Purpose is everything. So, so my, with regards, you know, I'll jump back into the author thing here, right? When you understand intrinsic motivation, the who, Man, it's amazing how you fast, how you know, much faster you get up because people like me do things like this, yep. as well as pushing through gritty, you know, like pushing through rejection, pushing through, hey, can I come and speak to your group on this topic? Nope. All right. 
I'm going to go ask somebody else. Why? Because the mission is clear and it's critical and I believe in it. Yeah. And I believe in my capacity to communicate something that's powerful and can change lives. One of the things that's standing out for me in, in what you talked about is as you talked about grit, I heard friction. Oh yeah. Uh, and when you talked about resiliency, I, I, I heard the, what comes right before the need for resiliency is no friction at all. If you get knocked down, you're just sitting there and you could sit there an awfully long time and it tends to feel good in, in an ironic way, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. well, I don't have to do anything today. Yeah. It doesn't require, uh, or doesn't create friction when you're just sitting there, mm. uh, crying in your soup. Yeah. So when you get back up, that, that process of resiliency puts you back into a place of friction. And I wonder, I wonder if friction is the evidence of something. What would oh. you, what would you uh, connect that That's to? That's a thoughts? really great question. You know, what's funny when, when you first said that, the thing that I thought of was, is, you know, when, like, for instance, on your hands, right, you go, you go to the gym, you start lifting, right? That friction, you start building calluses, you start, you know, framing a house or whatever you're doing. Part of that, part of that friction, I'll be honest, is, is, you know, is developing a tougher skin. You know, it's, it's, guess what? I'm not so thin skinned anymore. So the grit, you know, like sandpaper, right? That friction, it, it creates a, a, a bit of armor. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's like salty and sweet, right? You can't have one without the other. Resilience, you know, requires friction, right? Or a punch in the face or whatever you want to call it. And it's, you know, so, so it's, I think sometimes we would want to, you know, and I do this, by the way, I want to, I just poo poo things that are hard. Oh, it's hard. I don't want to do this. And why does everything have to be so difficult and all that kind of thing? But guess what? It creates a stronger version of you. Yeah. You know, those are very, very real emotional, right? Spiritual, mental muscles that we start to develop. But you can't develop those things unless you have that, that friction there. So, anyway, it's my initial thoughts. Yeah. Pressure makes diamonds. Oh yeah. And, um, <clears throat> it's just funny that you're saying that, that you guys are saying this right now, Dave, because, um, there's just some long range thoughts I was having in, in response to a recent, uh, pull through for me, um, without going into details because it has not yet fully materialized, but, um, the, the invitation was to be a, a co-author. Okay. Project. Now here's the rub. The co-authoring of this particular project intertwines like four out of four. If I had, I'm just picking the number four. It could be five. It could be 10. It doesn't matter. I get, I get straight across the board light up of every single thing that matters the most to me. Hmm. Like every single thing I've ever dreamed of writing about, spent years researching, reading, understanding, thinking about, meditating on all this experience and all this um, intellectual and spiritual force I have to bring to bear on this. Hmm. And it's extremely risky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is, it's like, it, it, cause I, cause of course I think about if I'm going to put my name on something, then I, in, I view myself as responsible as well to promote. Oh it. man. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be fine if I was promoting, you know, um, uh, power of positive thinking. Yeah. Right? That's, that's fine. But we're talking about material here that in some case, in some instances can pull, can make people want to, you know, pull out rocks and throw them at you. And I'm thinking, do I really want to be involved in that? Do, do I, do I want to, you know, get out there and, and start um, having my reputation assailed by people and, yeah. and, and all of that? You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at keeping a low profile these days. And yet <clears throat> uh, it, 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 it beats so intrinsically within my chest. It yeah. circulates hour after hour in my head. I cannot get uninterested in it. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I hope when the audience sees and hears this, right, you're, you're seeing what it sounds like to be driven intrinsically mm -hmm. to spread a message that you cannot, I, like, I, like I, I don't want to die without having said this. And yet I, pro I could even die for saying it. <laughs> um, you know? So I think, I, it, like, I think it goes back yeah. to the idea of grit, like we just talked about. Uh, and David brings up that grit and friction are an indicator that you're doing something. Yeah. 
you know, you know, what's funny as you were, as you were talking about that, I, I, I forget who first said it. Um, but there's this, the phrase that where he says, I'm often wrong, but I'm never in doubt. Yeah. And, and I love that idea, right? This humility of, okay, get over yourself. Of course you're wrong. At the same time, you know, be a, be a person of substance. Don't yeah. shrink because somehow you think you're going to get chastised. I think I'll, I'll be honest. I think that the, the, um, that one of the scariest things about writing, you know, about this topic and, and trying to communicate these really what I think are eternal, you know, type truths, right? Truth claims is, well, what if I'm wrong? What if, what if I'm missing a little piece or I, or I nuance something, you know, in a, in a way that is, you know, just, heck, I didn't, I didn't know how I was saying something and I don't even believe what I said. I just didn't know how to say it right. You know, just ignorance, that kind of thing. Or even, you know, toward the beginning of our call, right? You start talking about things that are kind of political hot button issues. And, you know, what if, what if I come across like a, like a total jerk? Well, well guess what? When I'm talking about, you know, uh, situations in our world that just stink, Mm -hmm. I've got a big question mark around them. Things that I probably, you know, I would disagree with. Well, part of grit and part of resilience is looking in the mirror first, right? And understanding I'm often wrong. Ah, I like this idea of never in doubt because I don't care if I get corrected. I'll just pivot. I, I like new information. If I'm wrong and I realize it, well, guess what? I'll write another book. Yeah. But that, but the, again, there's something below all of that. And for me personally, right, when I have when I've understood my authenticity, it's grace. It's no. it's absolute stunning, ridiculous, extravagant grace. And I don't have to have it all together. I don't have to be perfect. In fact, I never will. So so I think that there's a way to, you know, have difficult conversations, write about difficult things, and do them with um you know, a, a sense of mission, masculinity, authority, and yet, mm -hmm. you know, have, 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 have open hands around it. You know, I, I sure wouldn't want people to, to think if I'm talking about something I disagree with and, you know, that I somehow I hate them or something like that. Right. I don't want to communicate that. That's not me because I'm, I'm probably yeah. more of a screw up than they are. But what I want to communicate is I believe there is a plumb line. I believe yeah. there is true North. I believe there is a fixed point. You know, this, this idea of magnetic north versus true north, you know, that's something Dr. Andy talks about. Magnetic north like a compass, right? You're going to get close, but true north, you know, try living without that. Yeah. Right? You're, you're going to, you think, oh, this is what I believe. But unless you've really drilled in, you know, and, and with radical clarity, you're not going to be resilient. You're not going to have grit. You're going to suffer from imposter syndrome, apathy, avoidance, fatigue, anxiety, every single time you try to put yourself out there or you, or you try to lead your own children for that matter, because you don't even know what you believe. Yeah. And, and I would much rather right, my children as I'm leading them lead with clarity, kindness, grace, and conviction. You know, that, that just that, that beautiful ball of, okay, guys, we're going this way because I'm the dad and I'm going to lead. I might be wrong, but guess what? If I'm wrong, we'll pivot tomorrow. But yeah. I'm not going to not do something and I'm not going to leave, you know, some stupid gray area here. There's too much at stake. Yeah. So I think that, you know, there's, there's an undercurrent of grace, self-awareness to understand you truly, you know, as in human form here, understand resiliency and grit. Mm. Yeah. Well, the struggle that I hear in all of this, not only what you're bringing up, David, when you're talking about being a father and being a, ma a man and leading, uh, but connecting that to what, what Paul's take is is talking about with, you know, do I say these words essentially? Yeah. Do I put this out there? One of the great tasks of all fathers is to be able to tell their kid something that the child does not want to hear. Yeah. And is definitely going to argue about. And yet, it needs to be said. It needs to be mm. delivered in such a way that the that the end result is uh, coming together. But even if it takes a bit for that child to accept it, it yeah. has to be done. It has to be said because and, we're looking twenty years out, 
not two days out. Yeah, I love that. And and you're right. I mean, when the when the rubber meets the road, boy, you better you better have the conviction and the leadership ability to step up. Here's something else though, too, is you know, and this is one of the reasons I I want to go after dads. I love being a dad. And you know what? I think I've earned the place in my children's life through, I'm hoping, humility, right? Through extravagant love. I mean, even to this day, my son is 18. He's 220 pounds solid muscle. And he's in his second semester of college now. But when Parker comes home, I wrap my arms around him. I kiss him on the cheek. I grab him by the face. I put my forehead on his forehead. And I'm like, dude, I love you. What's up? You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm glad you're mine. Mm. I've, I've done that with him since day one. My dad did that with me. And, and so I think that, you know, what I don't want to communicate is this raw, 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 you know, fatherhood, masculinity, dads, you have to lead better. No, you had better be self-aware enough of your own idiocy, right? Dostoevsky says that humans were a mixed bag of contradictions every single day. So I think that if you if you don't walk with that paradigm, right? Being able to laugh at yourself, look at yourself, and at the same time have really strong convictions, your children are going to look at you like, "Dad, I see all of your bull crap. Don't act like it's not there." Yeah because you don't have to. And that's where grace is amazing, right? And so I, I think that, that you, can, you can walk in the full weight, right? Warts and all of who you are, lead with deep conviction, teach resiliency. I like this, I, I like this idea, by the way, you know, we always, we kind of laugh at this idea of, well, I'm pushing a rope uphill. Most parents feel that way with their kids. I mean, they're bribing them, you know, if you get these grades, you get money. I mean, if you if you don't study, I'm taking your phone away. If you, you know, all this kind of nonsense. Well, what would it look like to sit down with your children on a real regular basis and to start mining for gold? Mm -hmm. Hey, tell me what you think about this. You know, what, what kind of a person do you want to be? You know, what is it that lights you up when you walk out of a test? And, you know, uh, how do you want to feel about that? Well, I don't care. Well, guess what? They don't care because they're scared. It's not that they don't care. Of course they care. That's why they have so much emotion around it. So emotional intelligence, self-awareness in a family starts with the dad, right? Even in, in marriage, my, my buddy Quentin Hafner, who's a great author, he said, it, he asked this big group of men, he speaks to all kinds of men's groups, and just asked, what's the number one thing that your wife needs from you? And they were rattling off all this stuff about communication and all that kind of thing. And he said, nope. It's self-awareness and humility hmm. that, because then communication, right? If you're a really good communicator, you can communicate your way around anybody and just talk circles around them and be a bully. But if you lead with conviction, with humility, with self-awareness, right? That transparency, like, Hey, people like me, I do things like this and I know I'm not perfect, but guess what? Dad is here. Dad speaks with conviction and authority, tries to say what's true in love and nobody's going to reject that. They might yeah. reject the dad that speaks with authority and speaks what is true because he's an a-hole, right? But I mean, let's get real about it. There's a lot of parents that are kids, teenagers that roll their eyes at their children. I mean, at their parents for good reason, because their parents have just had, have been dictators and not human. And, yeah. and so when I, when I'm talking about grit and resilience, I want to paint a picture here that isn't a system it's a change of heart. It's a change of, uh, of everything that you know, not only about yourself, but about how to really love somebody. Hmm. Really good stuff, Dave. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading this. I'm, I'm hoping I can pull it off. So, so truth of the matter is the last three days, let's get real about writing a book. I've sat down to write and I'm like, I got nothing to say. Mm -hmm. it's fascinating as, you know, as I'm sitting here talking with you guys, I can, I mean, I'm seeing your faces, right? I can tell that you're engaged. You guys care about stuff. And, and of course, you know, Paul, I've known you to know that you're a good and kind and noble man. So, so I can, I, I feel safe to kind of talk about these concepts, but it's amazing, right? You get up in the morning and it's four 30 and that's my time to write. And I'm like, I'm all alone. I'm like, Oh no, you know, it's the, the imposter. It's that, it's maybe that self-imposed punch in the face, right? 
mm-hmm. that self doubt, and I need to harness resilience. I uh, part of part of the reason I'm writing this, guys, is because if I don't, I, you know, if I don't teach it, if I don't write it, I don't I don't harness it for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I might have to go back and listen to this podcast and start writing down some things that I said because in the moment, right when my heart is excited and full, these things come out of me in a way you know, that might not on paper. And that, by the way, that's a whole nother topic with regards to different modes of writing. You know, how do, how do some people actually get their, their passion out? It's really different for, you know, various writers. Well, the, one of the things that comes to my mind in that is the, the process of resiliency and grit that you've connected us to in that moment when it's 4.30 in the morning, you are hoping for sunrise to come. It's sitting alone, perhaps. I can yeah. I can sense where you're at. Oh man. And I remember when I was writing my book, I wrote I began a chapter uh describing the coffee shop that I was in and the people who were walking by to bring the person into the chaos of uh settling down into my thoughts. Mm. And I did it on purpose, not because um I it was you know, I was, wasn't trying to be dramatic. I was trying to be real. Hmm. And I don't remember what the chapter was in, uh, where I, where I started that. But I remember when I, when I sent it to Paul, who was, who was coaching me through my writing, Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a topic of discussion and I can see, uh, I can see a chapter or a part where you start and you're just, you are inviting us to sit there with you as men in the early morning as you lead your household in that moment early riser everybody else is asleep you're you are now processing the things that this family needs yeah from you the only you can give it yeah when no one else is awake God. i i had a by the way there's a a friend of mine i haven't seen her in quite some time sue buchanan she's written like very very kind of famous children's books and Uh, She told me one time, David, just write. It might not even go in the book, but everything, you know, that's, that, that is kind of boiling up in you needs to, needs to come out. Yeah. And, and it's amazing, by the way, I I don't consider myself a fiction writer by any stretch of imagination. I mean, I wrote the little kid's book, but that's, you know, a totally different story there as it were. And so the other day I sat down and I started writing and you know what came out? was a, a, a little, well, little chunk of a paragraph about a toy store and a toy maker. And, and by the end of that story, and I'd be happy if we have time, I'll read the paragraph to you. Um, by the time we got to the end of that story, I realized that, that the mission for me is not about building resilience for people and grit and self-awareness so that you can feel safe, so that you can stare at your own belly button forever and create your little perfect world. It's purpose. If, if, if you, if you haven't built uh, the, you know, that sense of identity and stuff unto and into purpose, right? What is your mission? What dent mm-hmm. are you having? You have not found it. Everything was made for a purpose, maybe not wasps, but everything else was, you know, insects, fire, water, blades of grass, trees, every single creature was made for something. Yeah. And, and I, so I, I really believe that my mission here is not, I want to, you know, if you get knocked down to get back to zero, you know, and okay, let's, let's push through some hard things. I want you to find out what it is that just completely lights you up so that you, well, Paul, it's what you were talking about. You can't avoid it. It's always on your mind. What is that thing? And, and it might be writing songs. It might be being a mom, right? I don't care. You know, you get to, you get to identify that. That's not my, it's none of my business. And by the way, 10 years from now, it might be something different. You know, we kind of change and grow. But when I wrote this, the, the, the little paragraph about the toy store, I got to the end of it and I realized that I had just written a, a you know, fictitious story about my mission. Mm. Mm-hmm. It seems to me, I don't know, I, I don't know what you're thinking, Paul, but uh, David, if you wanted to read that, paragraph it seems that maybe that would be a fitting close okay to this episode Mm. 
Okay, well, let me let me uh, let me take a stab at it here. So you're an orphan teenager, and you're standing in the alley that happens to be your home. Your home is made of pallets, some old tin roofing, and filthy blankets. You've been there for quite some time. It's drizzling outside, and you're very cold inside and out. You were looking in the side window of a beautiful toy store, and when I say beautiful, I want you to picture the most beautiful store you've ever imagined. Beautiful stained wood beams, gleaming stone floors, lights that almost dance, toys that are larger than you and music playing, people laughing, workers whose faces show that they're more on a mission than at work. This is the place to be except for you. You stand in the cold, dark alley next to the side window, hoping not to be seen. Your clothing is dirty, torn, and unacceptable. And you are filled with sadness, masked by rage. But even that rage is just a flickering light. You are done. You have nothing left. As you stand in the cold, dark alley, you glance in the side window. That night, the toy maker sees you and makes eye contact with you. You recoil in fear back into the night. But that night you can't sleep. You keep thinking about the expression on the toy maker's face. You've never seen an expression like that on anyone's face. It was as if he knew you and that curious smile he had was an invitation to Christmas dinner. And for a millionth of one second, you let your imagination and your deepest desire, desire. After many nights of staying away, really out of fear that his expression would be that of disdain and disgust, you decide to look in the window once again but this time you're ready to strike. As you gather the courage to glance inside, you start to hear the music and laughter and something inside of you melts. Your first glance ruptures something inside of you because there he is, looking in the same direction as if he'd never taken his eyes off from that pane of glass. The expression on his face this time is so bright and full that you completely forget about everything that's ever happened to you. He gestures to you, come on in. We've been waiting for you. You feel the ground under you moving, moving you in further and further until you're standing next to him, the toy maker. He puts his massive arm around you, smiles and chuckles and says, welcome home. Right then another worker asks for your help. Like you've been there for a hundred years. You're so intrigued by all the joyful hustle and bustle that you don't even care that you have no idea what to do. The joy, the community, the mission inside of this store is on hyperdrive and you just wanna be a part of it, a part of something part of anything, something good. By this time, you've forgotten all about your wet and very dirty clothing. No one cares because there's so much work to be done. Joy is being tossed around like a football and it's almost too much to handle. But you're now a part of this good and great work. You have moments where you glance outside into the darkness, but only after a short time of being inside the toy store, it feels like hundreds of years ago. You found your home, your people and there's work to be done. Mm. So my, my point in this is there's work to be done, right? There's mission that's critical. We all feel like the orphan, that imposter, right? We, we, we would long quite often to feel like a worker be in that beautiful toy store, being a part of this great work, right? Yeah. And guess what, gentlemen, we often would dare to feel like the toy maker right? That's what our children need. And, and gentlemen, I'm hoping I can communicate this in some way that is, that stirs the heart and is, and is not some, you know, dry manual. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give some tangible takeaways and some examples, but I want to communicate something here that, that, you know, would cause someone to delight in his children right? That they would know fully that they are the object of his delight and nothing they can do, you know, would cause him to change the expression on his face. You know, welcome home. You belong here. Hmm. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. There's work to be done. Let's go. Let's get after it. There's a kingdom to be built here. Yeah. Beautifully written and <clears throat> uh, very, very evocative. Thank you. Uh, and uh, does a fantastic job of illustrating that that potential reality we can all tap into. So I appreciate that. Bravo to you, my friend. Thanks. 
I find it difficult at this point to say anything other than this has been another fantastic episode of the Emissary Authors podcast with our guest and friend, David Osk, author of the forthcoming book, The Guardians of Grit. And I am Paul Edwards, your host, along with Jason Todd, my co-host, as the Emissary Publishing Authors podcast. We will see you next time.